Hello, welcome to today's webcast, Tobacco Cessation Coverage and State Exchange, a discussion. The presentation and sound are being streamed to your computer. Please check the speaker volume on your computer and adjust as needed. Make sure the media player on your screen is enabled. If you're able to, if you are having trouble hearing the audio or seeing the slides move, then refresh the computer console by refreshing, by pressing F5 or Command plus R on the Mac. If you have any questions, any additional um, technical problems, please type them in the Q&A box. The webcast will be recorded and will be available 24 hours after its conclusion. Now I will turn the presentation over to Anne DiGiulio. Thank you so much, Yvonne. And I just would like to reiterate and welcome everybody to today's webcast titled Tobacco Cessation Coverage and State Exchanges, a discussion. Um, just to let everybody know, there is a corresponding report to this webcast. Um, it's been sent out in a number of registration emails. If you've got any questions, please feel free to email myself um, or any member of the Lung team if you, know, if you need it. Um, it's also available at lung.org slash cessation coverage. Also, I would just like to reiterate the point. We do have a Q&A box, and we'd love to make this a discussion once myself and my colleagues have gone over the present the information. Um, please feel free to type in questions, both if you're having technical issues or if you actually have substantive issues. We do want to have leave a time at the end for a discussion. So again, I would like to introduce myself and my colleague Zara Giasudin, who will be talking. Um, my name is Anna Giulio. I'm the National Director of Lung Health Policy here at the American Lung Association. I direct two of our federal CDC grants and also lead our tobacco cessation policy work. Zara is, um, was our, is our cessation intern this semester. Um, she's received her MPH from the George Washington University with a focus in global public health. She has experience working in academic, nonprofit, and multilateral organizations focusing on public health issues. She's also the person that has collected these data and that will be presented later, so she's got very intimate knowledge of what we're going to be talking about. I'd like to share kind of what our objectives, of, our objectives are of this presentation. By the end of the presentation, we hope that you as the participants will understand what tobacco cessation coverage and state exchange plans is and what the implications of that are. Um, additionally, we would like the same for barriers to that coverage. And kind of going over what we're going to talk about today, um, first we're going to talk a little bit just so we're on the same page of a comprehensive cessation benefit, although I think most people on the phone generally know what that is. Um, also, we're going to talk about different cessation coverage requirements and exchange plans, talk a little bit about the tobacco surcharge, and then we're going to talk about the exchange population demographic, then we'll present the data to everyone, and we do have some time left over at the end for some Q&A. So please feel free to enter your questions in. So now, comprehensive cessation benefits. The 20, 2008 Treating Tobacco Use and Dependence Guide lists the seven FDA-approved medications, so the NRT gum, patch, lozenge, inhaler, nasal spray, bupropion, and varenicline as all first-line treatments to treat tobacco dependence. The gum, patch, and lozenge are available over the counter. Um, however, with most insurance, including exchange insurance, an individual would need a prescription to get that at no or low cost. Additionally, this recommendation also includes the coverage of counseling, both individual group and phone counseling. So that is kind of when we talk about a comprehensive benefit, we're talking about those 10 treatments. We, unfortunately, we know there are a number of common barriers to accessing care. So the first is cost sharing, and this includes copay, deductible, or co-insurance. Prior authorization, meaning needing um, approval from the insurance company in addition to having that prescription to get that treatment. A duration limit, so maybe you're only allowed to be on a medication for you know, two months or maybe of the year or maybe you know, for the first, you know, maybe it's a month you're only allowed to be on it. An annual or a lifetime limit, so this is you know, you're only allowed to quit once this year, or maybe you're only allowed to quit three times over the course of your lifetime. Next is dollar limits. So this could be when an insurance company said, hey, we're going to spend $500 on your quit attempts this year, and that's it. 
Next is step care therapy. So this is having to try and fail on one treatment before going to the next. And this really is a barrier in the context of tobacco cessation because we know that from that previous slide that all the medications are considered first-line treatment to treat tobacco dependence. And then lastly is required counseling, and this is when an insurance company or a Medicaid program may require an individual to be on counseling in order to get medication. While we know that um, a combination of counseling and medications are the best way that somebody is going to quit, we also don't want to make their, we don't want there to be any barriers to anybody trying to quit. So this is, this is why we could categorize it as a barrier. However, we would always encourage an individual to get counseling and medication. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what the coverage requirements are for tobacco cessation treatment in exchange plans. So the coverage requirements really come from the Affordable Care Act, which created a number of protections for people with private insurance, both employer-sponsored as well as in the individual market. However, we're going to be talking mainly about the individual market today. So I'm just going to go through a few of these, and then we'll kind of dig in. So guaranteed issue is, regardless of pre-existing condition, an insurance company cannot deny you health care coverage. The next one is essential health benefits, which we'll get into more in a minute, but this means that insurance coverage has to mean something. So you have to meet um, coverage requirements in these 10 categories. Insurance companies have to allow dependent children to stay on their parents' health insurance until they're 26, and they can only change the rates or the premiums for insurance based on four things. Age, you can only charge the oldest person three times as much as the youngest person. Family size, so you can charge a larger family more for insurance than a smaller family or an individual. Geography, recognizing that the cost of care is impacted by the, your geography. Um, real estate is more expensive in some parts of the country than others, so that can change it. And then tobacco use status. You can charge an individual 50% more of their premiums if they use tobacco. Lastly, states can and some do offer additional protections. Um, so that is another place that we can talk about. But I really want to dig into the essential health benefits. And so if you can see this slide, um, you can see that it talks about a number of different things that we would consider just normal parts of health insurance. So prescription drug coverage, hospitalizations, ER services, um, maternity care. Uh, but so these are the 10 things that really have to be covered. And I'd like to highlight one towards the end um, that preventive and wellness services and chronic disease management. And so this is the preventive service benefit. Again, this needs to be applied to certain plans, basically any private plan, including any plan sold in the exchange, small group plans, individual plans, Medicaid expansion, and association health plans. And again, today we're talking mainly about the exchange plans. So what does preventive, what does the preventative service requirement mean? So what the preventive service requirement means is any treatment that the United States Preventative Services Task Force, which is a non-governmental body, has given an A or B grade to, um, has to be covered by those plans that I've mentioned before, including the exchange plans, without cost sharing. And that is clearly written in statute. So the cost sharing piece you can't get out of. Um, and we are lucky to know that tobacco cessation for non-pregnant adults gets an A grade from USPSTF for both medications and counseling. So that benefit that we talked about a few minutes ago has an A grade that it is what helps smokers quit. However, USPSTF, or the United States Preventative Services Task Force, is clinical language and is not insurance department language. So in 2014, the Departments of Labor, Treasury, and Health and Human Services issued an FAQ on how the tobacco cessation recommendation should be implemented. These three federal departments are the departments that oversee health care in various places. And this FAQ kind of acts as a translation, translational device, and translates that clinical language into insurance coverage language. Um, again, tobacco cessation gets an A grade, as I mentioned. So what they have said is that every 
that every insurance company should be covering to be in compliance with this with the USPSTF A grade for cessation. Um, at least a quit attempt should be at least four sessions of individual group or phone counseling, 90 days of all FDA approved smoking medications when prescribed. That's one quit attempt. There should be at least two quit attempts offered per year. There should be no cost sharing, which reiterates federal law. Additionally, they went a step further and said there should be no prior authorization. So that's kind of that translational piece. And that is what we currently have to go under. Um, additionally, in September of 2015, the USPSTF updated their recommendation. They reaffirmed the A grade for cessation medications for, and counseling for non-pregnant adults. Um, just to let everybody know, there is currently a um, USPSTF recommendation that is being updated on this. Um, the draft also reaffirmed the same language. But the final is not out yet. So as soon as that is, Lung Association will be updating it, and we're happy to share it with everybody, too. So I just wanted to talk a little bit, switch gears a little bit to talk about the tobacco surcharge. Um, the tobacco surcharge is something that's effective for the, could be effective for these plans, and just want to kind of give everybody a quick overview. So kind of what are we talking about it? So the Affordable Care Act allows two different mechanisms, essentially, for um, people who use tobacco or smokers to be charged more than people who don't use tobacco or don't smoke. So there are two pieces. So first there's the tobacco surcharge, and then there's the wellness incentive, which is a non-smoker discount. Essentially, these two things are the, different, are the two different sides of the same coin. At the end of the day, um, both of them, in essence, charge tobacco users more for health care coverage. And I'm going to go through them in detail in a second. So first, the tobacco surcharge. So the, as I mentioned, the Affordable Care Act, one of the four variables that um, an, empl uh, an employer, excuse me, an insurance plan can vary a premium is on tobacco use. So they can charge an individual or a family 50% more than they would have charged the same individual had they not used insurance. Um, states are able to limit or prohibit this for the individual and small group market. Um, seven states prohibit it and four additional states limit what the surcharge can be. Um, again, the insurer is the, is the entity that puts, puts this surcharge in place. Additionally, the Affordable Care Act, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more in a minute, provides premium discounts in the form of advanced premium tax credits for individuals making 400% of the federal poverty or less, that's about $50,000 for an individual. The tobacco surcharge does not impact the amount of the advanced premium tax credit an individual would get. So for example, say that your premium is $100 and because of your income, you get a discount every month of $50 you could be charged $150 if you're a tobacco user. You would still only get that $50 premium. It won't be increased to $75 because, you're, because of the higher premium due to tobacco use. So it really can't discourage people from enrolling in coverage. A little bit different and not really talked about, but I think it's just an important context to set. A wellness incentive, again, are mainly done by employers. In terms of a wellness incentive, um, employers need to provide a reasonable alternative standard for an individual to enroll in if they, you know, do use tobacco or would be subject to other wellness incentive requirements. Um, so it's a little bit different. Um, but again, the total more you can be charged is 50% if you are um, a smoker. And then lastly, just kind of what the research says. Do they work? And um, the answer is no. They don't. Um, the data show that people aren't necessarily quitting because of the tobacco surcharge, but they are foregoing health care and health insurance. And so that can be really problematic because then not only are they not getting the health insurance that they need to quit smoking, but they're also not getting the health insurance they need to potentially treat um, tobacco-caused illnesses that they might have. So I just wanted to flag that. And we do track tobacco surcharges in these data that my colleague Zara will go into in a minute. And then lastly, I just kind of want to spend a few minutes talking about the population demographics of the exchanges. 
And I'm going to apologize. This is a very busy slide, um, but there's a lot of great information on there. So first and foremost, kind of what, what are some of the numbers telling us? So we know that during the 2020 open enrollment, and again, that was when people enrolled between November 1st, 2019, and December 15th, 2019, for coverage effective on January 1, 2020, 11.4 million people enrolled in health insurance. So that's through the exchanges. So that is great. Um, we have 2019 data about kind of where those people were income level wise. So we know that those advanced premium tax credits, so again, that's top, the population making 400% of the federal poverty level or less, um, that was, which is about $50,000 a year. Um, again, 87% of individuals enrolled in the exchanges get an advanced premium tax credit and thus are make under 400% of the federal poverty level. Another tool that the Affordable Care Act has um, is they offer um, cost-sharing reduction silver plans. These plans offer additional protections um, on cost-sharing, including um, out-of-pocket costs, co-pays, co-insurance, and kind of just reduce those for lower-income individuals. And those are people making 250% of the federal poverty or less. Minor less, that's about $32,000 a year, or um, just under $2,700 a month. So again, fairly low income. Additionally, we do know that because of the COVID-19 and the economic downturn associated with it, there is an increased enrollment in the exchanges. Um, when an individual loses ESI or employer-sponsored insurance, they can they automatically trigger a special enrollment period, and so they can enroll in these exchange plans. Um, there are estimates that 27 million Americans have already lost employer-sponsored coverage this year. Um, those estimates also show that 8.4 million of those individuals are 400% of the federal poverty or less, and so can get help. Um, definitely with advanced premium tax credits, again, that lowers the um, cost of the premium, and then some of those most likely will also get qualified for the CSR silver plan, so that means that that's going to limit their out-of-pocket cost, out cost sharing um, and lower the deductible. So, just recognizing that even though this was important a few months ago, it's even more uh, poignant and relevant today. And then lastly, just kind of looking at kind of how this intersects with the data that we know around smoking rates. So again, we know that the general population smokes at a fairly low rate of 13.7%. However, individuals on the lower income spectrum, and this defined in the MMWR that we cite here as under $35,000 a year, smoke at a higher rate of 21.3%, um, kind of indicating, and if you look at that and cross it with the people that, um, you know, recognizing that a large number of people, about half in the exchange population, are about at that level, recognizing that this population probably smokes at a higher rate. The good news is, with all of that, is that we know that regardless of income level or any of the other demographics that most smokers want to quit, it's about 70%. So we have a really great opportunity to help them. And now I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Zara, who's going to go over um, the data and kind of how we got it. So Zara, are you on? Yeah, thank you. So as Ann mentioned, I'm going to go into the methodology we used for this report. Between March 14th and June 30th, the Lung Association collected smoking cessation coverage data for plans available to individuals and families through marketplaces in each state and the District of Columbia. Data were collected through the healthcare.gov finder site. Additionally, American Lung Association staff analysts obtained data for each state-specific geographic rating area by entering the appropriate zip code. To ensure consistency in the data, the following demographic information was inputted to gather smoking cessation coverage data for each rating area in each state in the District of Columbia. We inputted female for gender, April 6, 1986 for date of birth, yes to tobacco use, less than one for months since last usage, and no for spouse or dependent. To collect information on tobacco surcharges, we inputted all of this demographic information twice once as a smoker and once as a non-smoker. To categorize smoking cessation coverage and barriers to treatment, 
state marketplace and insurance plan websites where search for preferred drug lists, formularies, member and provider handbooks, coverage policies, and other relevant documentation. As Anne mentioned earlier, the 2008 Public Health Services Clinical Practice Guideline on Treating Tobacco Use and Dependence describes an evidence-based, comprehensive tobacco cessation benefit. This benefit includes individual, group, and telephone counseling and the seven FDA-approved cessation medications, which are bupropion, renaclin, and the five nicotine replacement therapies, which include the gum, patch, lozenge, inhaler, and nasal spray. The gum patch and lozenge are available over the counter, and as Anne mentioned earlier, if a patient wants to get them with no cost sharing, they can receive a prescription from their provider in order to receive no cost sharing. The United States Preventative Service Task Force has repeatedly given these tobacco cessation treatments in A grade. It's important to note that throughout the data collection process, we were brand neutral. In addition to assessing coverage of this comprehensive cessation benefit in state marketplaces, we also assessed barriers to accessing cessation treatment. Most state exchanges did not include detailed information to accurately assess barriers to access counseling. As a result, these barriers were only assessed for cessation medication. The barriers to treatment examined included duration limits, annual limits, lifetime limits, cost sharing, prior authorization, requiring, requiring counseling as a prerequisite for receiving medication, theft care therapy, dollar limits, and tobacco surcharges. To categorize smoking cessation coverage and barriers to treatment, data were classified as yes, no, varies, not specified, not available, and insufficient information. Yes indicated that all the state's exchange plans cover the cessation treatment or impose the treatment barrier. No indicated all the state's exchange plans do not cover the treatment or do not impose the treatment barrier. Varies indicated that some of the state's exchange plans cover the treatment or impose the treatment barrier, while other plans do not. Not specified indicated the state exchange plans indicate that a cessation treatment is covered, but do not specify which treatment this refers to. A common example of this would be indicating that cessation counseling is covered, but not specifying whether this refers to individual, group, or telephone counseling, which is some combination of these. Not available indicated that the state's exchange plans do not disclose information on coverage of the treatment or treatment barrier. And lastly, insufficient information indicated that the state does not provide publicly accessible or available information for at least some of its exchange plans. So now to get into our results. As pictured here in gray, we found that there were 16 states that did not have complete information available for healthcare coverage for their exchange and release. As a result, we could only assess cessation coverage and barriers to cessation treatment for exchange and release in 35 states, including the District of Columbia. So for 35 states, including the District of Columbia, we did find data available on their state exchange plans in 2020. Among these 35 states, 22 covered all seven medications for all exchange and release. A total of 34 states covered bucopriene for all exchange and release. 33 states covered varenicline for all exchange and release. And lastly, a total of 29 states indicated that they covered counseling for all exchange and release. However, not every plan specified which type of counseling was covered. As a result, the data was reported as not specified. In regards to barriers, we found in 2020, most states with available data have tobacco surcharges in place for exchange and release. Of the 35 states with data available, 20 states imposed tobacco surcharges for all exchange and release, while nine states imposed tobacco surcharges for some exchange and release. Of the 35 states with data available, 13 states placed duration limits on at least some cessation medications for all exchange and release, while 16 states place duration limits on at least some of these medications for some exchange and release. In 2020, most states are complying with the May 2014 sub regulatory guidances, copay, and prior authorization provisions for cessation medication coverage. Of the 35 states with data available, 32 states covered at least some tobacco cessation medications without cost sharing. Two states imposed cost sharing on at least some cessation medications for some exchange and release, and one state did not disclose information on cost sharing. 
Of the 35 states with data available, 31 states covered at least some tobacco cessation medications without prior authorization. Three states, however, have prior authorization requirements on at least some cessation medications for some exchange enrollees. And one state did not disclose information on prior authorization. This newly reported data for 2020 shows that states are covering tobacco cessation medications with limited barriers, but still have room to improve their coverage of and access to tobacco cessation treatment. As Anne mentioned earlier, all of this data presented here is included in the report, which can be found on lung.org slash cessation coverage, as well as in the email for the most recent registration question. So what do our results mean? In the 35 states that we were able to collect data for, many plans are providing tobacco cessation treatment for some or all exchange enrollees. 22 of the 35 states cover all seven FDA-approved cessation medications and all plans, indicating that these medications are available in those states. While a majority of states are covering tobacco cessation treatment in their marketplaces, there is room for state exchange plans to improve in providing comprehensive tobacco cessation coverage without barriers. In 2020, some or all exchange plans in 29 states impose duration limit requirements for accessing at least one cessation treatment for exchange enrollees. Furthermore, some or all exchange plans in 29 states impose tobacco surcharges for exchange enrollees. Failing to cover all proven cessation treatments and imposing barriers such as tobacco surcharges and duration limits makes it more difficult for exchange enrollees to access cessation treatments and successfully quit smoking. Also, while many states cover cessation counseling, there is a lack of specificity on the types of counseling offered for exchange enrollees. This could create confusion for patients on how to access these services, which are important components of tobacco cessation treatment, especially given the combination of cessation counseling and medications gives adults the best chance of quitting smoking. There needs to be more publicly facing consumer friendly information to help consumers navigate and select among and gain access to the specific cessation treatment or combination of cessation treatments they need. So what is the research saying? The 2020 Surgeon General's report on smoking cessation finds that insurance coverage for smoking cessation treatment that is comprehensive, barrier-free, and widely promoted increases the use of these treatment services, leads to higher rates of successful quitting, and is cost-effective. It also finds that smoking places a substantial financial burden on smokers, healthcare systems, and society. Smoking cessation reduces this burden, including smoking attributable health care expenditures. In 29 states, some or all exchange enrollees are charged higher premiums based on tobacco use. 2014 and 2016 health affairs studies indicate that imposing tobacco surcharges does not encourage smokers to quit and can deter smokers from purchasing health insurance. Forgoing health insurance coverage can leave smokers and potentially their families as well without coverage for treatments that can help them quit, as well as for treatments for tobacco-related illnesses. Additionally, a 2014 CDC study suggested improving other barriers to accessing cessation treatments, such as limitations on the number of quit attempts and duration of treatment, may deter smokers from using cessation treatments and thus make it more difficult for them to quit. Currently, of the 35 states that have data available, 29 states place duration limits on at least one cessation medication for some or all of their exchange in LA. So to conclude, during the 2020 open enrollment period, approximately 11.4 million individuals were enrolled in an exchange plan across all 50 states in the District of Columbia. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the accompanying economic downturn, more individuals and families are becoming eligible for coverage in state exchanges. The widespread job loss associated with this downturn is causing many Americans to lose their employer-sponsored health insurance. Estimates indicate that nearly 27 million people could lose their employer-sponsored health insurance in the first half of 2020, of whom 8.4 million could be eligible for marketplace subsidies. Individuals who have lost employer-sponsored health care coverage are eligible for special enrollment in the individual insurance market. Smoking remains the leading cause of preventable death and disease, claiming over half a million Americans a year. 
Smoking also increases the risk of severe illness from COVID-19. Anecdotal reports from state quit lines report that the COVID-19 pandemic is motivating some smokers to quit, but that the stress associated with this pandemic and its economic effects can also make it more difficult for smokers to quit. As a result, it is more important than ever to ensure that the vulnerable and growing population in state exchanges have ready access to the help they need to quit smoking. There's still more that needs to be done. While state health insurance marketplaces have expanded access to healthcare, including tobacco cessation treatment, no state offers comprehensive coverage without barriers to all of their exchange enrollees. In addition, 16 states did not have complete information on their health care coverage for exchange enrollees available on healthcare.gov. While the Affordable Care Act allows insurers to charge tobacco users surcharges up to 1.5 times the premiums charged to non-tobacco users, states are able to impose lower caps on these surcharges or prohibit them altogether. As of 2017, seven states prohibit these charges in the individual market. It would be helpful for studies to examine if states that impose tobacco surcharges have higher numbers of uninsured tobacco users, lower rates of successful quitting among the exchange enrollees, and higher rates of smoking and tobacco use in this population. And if states that bar such surcharges see the opposite effect. Additionally, it's important to approve consumers easy access to clear, specific information on coverage of preventative services through formularies and other sources in order for them to make informed decisions about which health plan best meets their needs. Providing comprehensive, barrier-free cessation coverage to state exchange and release, commuting, communicating this coverage clearly, and promoting it to providers and exchange and release who smoke can play a critical role in increasing cessation, reducing smoking rate, improving health outcomes, and reducing healthcare spending in this population. Now I'll turn it over to Anne for questions. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much, Zara. That was really great. Um, so we've already had a couple questions come in, and my col our colleague Reggie is going to help us um, monitor, monitor that and um, facilitate the question and answer portion. But just to remind everybody, if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, one of the widgets or boxes is a Q&A button. If you click that, you can type in your question, and um, we will do our best to get to all of them. So, Reggie, if you want to unmute yourself and see what questions we've already had come in, that'd be great. Yeah, hi. Um, so, we do have a few questions. So, and when you were discussing coverage benefits, why did you specify non-pregnant adults? Great. Yeah, that's a great question. So, the United States Preventative Services Task Force, um, kind of that group of experts and scientists who really know and study the research, make those recommendations based upon scientific peer-reviewed evidence that they have. Um, unfortunately, for a number of reasons, both good and bad, um, there aren't a lot of peer, there aren't really peer-reviewed studies on the impact of um, tobacco cessation medications on pregnant women as well as their um, fetuses and kind of health outcomes, you know, both for the woman and for the children, for the baby. Um, so, that is, gets an I grade, which means there's incomplete, insufficient in evidence as to whether this is beneficial or harmful. Um, you know, as, so it's kind of just a big question mark. The other piece of that, and I know I think believe this was also kind of alluded to, is from a coverage perspective, um, an insurance company doesn't, while they do a little bit in Medicaid, they don't really parse it out. Um, coverage for pregnant women versus coverage for all adults. So, um, kind of, we're looking at coverage for all adults. Um, you know, I don't know, I don't believe a claim would be rejected um, or a prescription would be rejected, but I think that, you know, would depend on an individual insurance company. Uh, great. And then, next question that we have is although telephone counseling, smoke helpline should be an option that is available, don't we end up giving states? an easy out so that they don't offer any of the more intensive group and individual counseling options or maybe video calls for now and face-to-face -face eventually? That's a great question. So I believe this individual is referring to the fact that um, because we have quit lines that are free to almost any individual across the country, it seems like it could be an easy out for insurance companies just to send um, patients to that, you know, or providers just to send patients to that quit line. Um, there are a couple of pieces there. 
that, you know, to talk about. So first and foremost, I think it's really important to make sure that there's a financial relationship between the insurance company and the quit line, if that's going to be the case. Um, you know, the North American Quit Line Consortium, or NAC, has done a lot of work to help um, work with private insurance companies as well as private employers to make sure that that financial relationship is there and that the insurance company is really kind of checking off all the boxes as they refer people to that state quit line. Um, the way the Loan Association work, looks at the data is that we only consider somebody or a plan, whether that be a Medicaid plan, a private insurance plan, like we're looking at now, the state employee health plan, to consider that covered if there is that financial relationship there. Um, and as for an easy out, I think the idea of a comprehensive benefit is all three types of counseling are covered, and it's really kind of what the best option is between the patient and the provider. Same thing with the seven medications. Um, I'm a policy person, so I don't necessarily know what the best way for an one particular individual is to quit, but um, there are providers across the country who can assess that based upon a number of factors for every individual patient. Thank you um, for, for answering that. And then, oh, we have a lot of questions coming in. This is great. Um, so something actually, asked, could you please end on what you mean by a financial relationship? Uh, yeah, no, so a financial relationship, um, essentially, the, um, an insurance company can, um, can either, you know, directly reimburse somebody, um, directly reimburse the state quit line, um, and there are contracts to do that, um, that some companies or insurance plans have with states. Um, some state quit lines, and again, the North American Quit Line Consortium is going to have a lot more information on this than I am. They're really the experts. But um, some other ways that it's done is um, there are um, where in part of some of the intake questions, um, if a quit line asks some of those intake questions, um, some of the quit lines will actually then refer out patients to kind of whatever, you know, if the insurance company or their employer, um, their employer um, has their own contract with their own quit line. So, um, you know, they quit line, they contract specially with, you know, insurance, you know, quit line A. Um, that those can be either, you know, soft or cold handoffs for those people. So that's kind of what we mean with that financial relationship. So just posting on the website, you know, 1-800-QUIT-NOW doesn't mean that you cover insurance or, excuse me, phone counseling. Um, it's a great resource to advertise, but really you need to make sure that financial relationship is there. Unfortunately, though, as Zara had mentioned, most of the states, um, when they looked at counseling and reported counseling, just were not necessarily specific to talk about what type of counseling they provided. So um, it kind of puts both patients and providers at a disadvantage, so they don't know kind of what, what's at hand. Thank you so much for expanding on that. Um, and then another question we have is, what are the criteria you reclassify a former smoker as a non-smoker with respect to the tobacco surcharge, and how is it validated? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, what, as you're, you, anybody can go to um, healthcare.gov and enter in their information, or the Finder website that um, Zara had mentioned, which is finder.healthcare.gov. Um, and essentially, it's an honor system. So you you say that you're a smoker or you're not a smoker. Um, however, the one caveat to all of that from the in the exchange plan. Um, there are employer-sponsored plans. Sometimes there are coding tests that are required to be done and other types of things. But essentially, you just sign an affidavit as a, from in the exchange plans, an affidavit, you know, as you sign up that all the information you entered is correct. Um, if for some reason the insurance company finds out that you were lying and there is a tobacco surcharge, they can go back and, um, you know, reassess. Um, you know, reassess that, that, that cost. And just a reminder, if you've got any additional questions, I know we've got a couple left. Yes, we do have one more. So uh, in, the, in the queue, so if anybody does have questions, please um, feel free to submit them. Evidence suggests that uh, patients with investment in care 
co-pays reimbursements upon completion um, may be more likely to succeed in treatment. Is there any evidence of that based on the survey or the current rates of quick success in the data? That's a great question. So the data that we looked at was really kind of just what coverage exists in these exchange plans, um, not necessarily how likely an individual was to successfully quit. Um, I know there's varying degrees of evidence I would just point back to that the Affordable Care Act does require cessation treatment to be covered without cost sharing as part of a preventive services benefit. Um, and so unfortunately, our data don't go into those specific questions. Um, and you know, we were really kind of comparing it to both that FAQ document that I had mentioned and Zara had mentioned as well as kind of what the preventive service requirement is. And we'll just do one last call for any additional questions. Um, Well, I just would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your time. Um, we hope you enjoy the report as you read it. If you've got questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, additionally, in the follow-up email, there will be a link to an, a post-webcast assessment. We really appreciate your time both in this, but also in taking that assessment that really helps us um, show the value of these types of learning opportunities and continue to provide them for you. So again, I just want to say thank you um, to everyone who's helped on the back end of the webinar, to Zara for collecting all the data, and um, have a great day. So thank you so much, everyone.